as we know, is a very exact science. So I'm going to share with you some of the science from uh, my side of the, of the table. A little bit of history on, on deer populations in the province. Basically, uh, there was slow growth of the deer herd in the province until the 1960s. Um, in 1960, we had a peak harvest of 30,000 animals. Um, and then, of course, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, we had a series of really severe winters. I was a, a boy then. My father used to throw me off the roof of the house. We had that much snow back then, and we haven't seen winters like that until 2008. But uh, basically, we had a series of four of those in a row, and the herd declined dramatically to the point we only harvested 4,300 here in 1974. But then 10 short years later, we climbed right back up again to 30,000. So we had the carry capacity in the province to support a lot of deer. And then, of course, I'll talk a little bit more about what happened since then. So after that, this here is from 1985 onward, and you can see the graph isn't so positive. Um, it's just been a general decline over the last 30 years. Um, there was uh, a time where we tried to grow the deer herd from 2001 to 2007, and I was uh, at the controls then. We lowered the antlerless permits to uh, a little over 2,500, and we were going to try to grow the deer herd back up to 30,000 animals. And you can see how successful we were. The growth was slow, and the growth did not go very far. Um, at this time, we were starting to look and say, what's going on with deer in New Brunswick? Why aren't the deer, the deer growing like they once did? At this time, the, uh, the industry, forest industry, was also after more wood. So uh, there was a lot of wood tied up in what we call the conservation forest, and a lot of the conservation forest was deer yards. So with staff and DNR, we started looking at the deer yards to say, what kind of condition were they in? And we found that there was very few deer in Crown Land deer yards. Again, was another red flag saying, what's wrong on Crown Land? Um, for my 15 years, I flew the province every year in a helicopter. We flew from one another province to the other, 11 different management zones. We never saw deer in plantations. We would see the odd moose around plantations, but uh, usually you'd never see deer. What we did see, though, during these, the last little bit of the 2000s was uh, a huge increase. When we saw the increase up to 10,000, that growth occurred in and around urban, suburban areas and agricultural areas. So the growth wasn't occurring on Crown land. Um, and of course, our harvest in the last few years, that's exactly where they come from, which is uh, mostly private land. Usually when we talk about the deer situation, people say the surrounding jurisdictions have the same issue with deer. Their, their deer numbers are not good. Deer numbers are down everywhere. Um, so I called my friends in Quebec and Maine that have uh, collected their deer harvest numbers, and as you can see here from the chart, our numbers were 30,000 30 years ago. We're down to uh, 4,000, 5,000 right now. So we had an 85% decline in the last 30 years. Maine, which is the closest jurisdiction to us, very similar in size, very similar winters, and very similar coyote numbers. They're harvesting the same number of deer they did 30 years ago. Uh, there's a bit of spraying in, uh, in northern Maine. In Quebec, where they banned the spray of herbicide and back in 2001, their deer numbers are up over 300% in the last 30 years. So people that tell you there's not a problem with deer, I beg to differ with them. And again, the, the science here is exact numbers. How much food has been removed? Again, some more science. Uh, deer <coughs> eat about two kilograms of food a day. They're a herbivore, so they eat that food to stay alive. When we used to uh, let our cuts come back naturally, the big growth that we saw in the province way back in the 60s and 80s, we were doing a lot of harvesting with chainsaws on the ground and all those uh, cuts were coming back naturally. And what grows initially in your plant in your uh, cut areas is, herb is uh, hardwood trees. Lots of early successional hardwood trees. And usually there's 20 to 40,000 stems per hectare of deer browse in these untreated stands. That's a basically a ton of deer food per acre. So if we spray 32,000 acres a year, which is the number that we've done for the last 30 years, we remove basically 32,000 tons of deer food a year from Crown land. That's a significant amount of food. Um, to put it in layman's terms, it's uh, 2,500 dump trucks full of food every year is what we remove. Now usually when we talk about this area, it's always talked about as 1% of the land base, or sometimes they'll say it's only 25% of all that we harvest. But again, I'll tell you that those numbers aren't quite the same, but usually those numbers make it look smaller. 32,000 acres is a big chunk. Of, I'd love to own that 32,000 acres because it's a big chunk of land. It would feed about a third of the entire herd we have now. Over the last 30 years, it's removed 1 million tons of deer browse, which would feed a million deer. <coughs> it's not just what we do, but where we do it. The other thing that's changed, and many people don't realize that, is, is when we plant, it's where we plant. Because as foresters, we know that if you plant a little green tree in the ground where the soil is really good, it grows a lot better. 
So on crown land, now what we do, we and for the last 20 years we've done this, is we plant the areas with the highest site indices. So they're the richest sites out there on crown land. When they're cut, if it's a very rich site, we put it into a plantation. So we're taking and regenerating all the best sites on crown land in plantations, not in deer food or anything else. So the stuff that's left to come back naturally is usually poor sites, they're not well drained, they're on steep slopes. Basically it produ produces suboptimal deer food. So what we've done is we've basically lowered the carrying capacity for deer across the landscape on crown land and we see that in all these things I've been talking to you about. Feeding deer proves that deer food is, a, is what really matters. It's not coyotes, it's not winters, because despite coyotes and winters, when people feed deer, as they do all over the province, which is one of my biggest headaches when I was a deer biologist, deer will come in groves. And you don't have to have a deer yard, you don't have to have anything other than food, and the deer will stay there. So we know that food is the ultimate thing driving deer populations. Um, over the last few years, as we've been talking about this issue, I've had people contact me from other areas in North America saying, are you seeing problems with your animals? And I said, I don't think we will because deer leave crown land. They actually don't stay there and feed in that cut because there's no food left, so they're not consuming it. Although I wasn't thinking about the herbicide that's sprayed on agricultural crops. Um, this last year, the, the, there's a lot of research being done on this in Montana. They have all kinds of uh, different skeletal growths. Uh, which is what we saw here last year in New Brunswick, all of a sudden we started seeing these deer with really short lower jaws, very abnormal. This one here was from out in Keswick, this one was from uh, out in Birch Corner, and this one here was down just outside of uh, uh, St. John. So again, from different areas of the province, but they're all in areas where we actually have a fair bit of agriculture. So deer, we know deer are a problem. Uh, a lot of farmers complain about deer predation on their soybean crops. Um, and again, the only thing I can see is there, something's causing this, we don't know what it is, but someone at some time should look at this. And of course I keep saying we need to look at this issue, we need to study this issue and find out what's going on. Um, one of the biggest reasons I, the biggest thing that bothers me is, is misinformation. And, and I, I'm not sure why, I'm not sure how it happens, but there's misinformation that gets out into the, into the people's hands. Um, an example I'll use is the Chief Medical Health Officer's Action Plan on glyphosate that just came out last year. And if you read that, it's very clear they were going to do two things. They were going to look at what others were doing around North America, and they were going to look at the patterns of use in New Brunswick. They didn't look at the Health Canada Review. They never looked at research. So they didn't do an actual review of glyphosate and whether it's safe or not. They just looked at what, what's everybody else doing <coughs> and how much are we using. But yet when people quote this, they usually say that that report says that glyphosate use is okay. Well, she didn't do that. She actually looked at these two things, not whether it was okay to use or not. DNR stats, and again, we've had internal battles about that, and now we have it on the outside because I'm not there anymore, but uh, usually we call 25% of the area that it's sprayed, and actually it's 25% of the stands that sprayed. If you look at the actual area of ground, it's closer to 40%. So it's getting up to a lot higher number. 75% that's not treated is all of a sudden assumed to be good for deer. And the present deer biologist and myself both looked at that just cursory and found out that these poor sites, these wet sites, don't produce good deer food. So we don't actually have the deer out there we thought we did. Saying that herbicide spray suppresses growth. In the forest industry, that's not true. It kills that hardwood growth. And if the, if the hardwoods grow back again, then we'll spray it a second time. So you have to remove the hardwoods or the softwoods don't grow. Your plantations, according to the forest management, Manual have to be 95% stocked with softwood trees, so the hardwoods have to be gone. So again, I think it's a, it's a soft sell, but it doesn't really give the, a clear picture. That says that it will come back and it'll be available. The Forest Info website, I probably just shouldn't even talk about that because it, it kind of winds me up when I read some stuff in there, but it basically says there's, there's no problem with deer, and of course I've showed you by the numbers here that there is problems. There's lots of scientists that have a lot to say about the issue. Dr. Karian Vrain is a retired agriculture, federal agriculture uh, biologist. He's been outspoken since he re he's retired. He worked there for 30 years. Um, he did a lot of talking. Um, I didn't realize glyphosate was really an issue. I just had a deer issue until I heard him talk and say all the problems that he found it was creating. Dr. Coombs is a retired uh, microbiologist from the University of Brunswick. He gave a presentation here last year in Fredericton about the real issues behind glyphosate and what it does molecularly and why it's an issue. Uh, Dr. Rod Savage is also a UMB uh, professor of uh, tree physiology and he also has a lot of concerns with the use of glyphosate. What's happening right now though is everybody's pointing to the Health Canada Review and that is going to be the, 
be all and end all to, to kind of uh, summarize everything on the issue with glyphosate. And when usually people point to that, they always talk about the science that's involved in the Health Canada Review. Now, I'm not sure how much time you guys have spent looking at the Health Canada Review. It's a large document, 359 pages, and no one that I've talked to yet has ever take, uh, sat down and actually read it through and seen what it actually says. I'm hoping that Tim you might have done that, but I'm not sure. Um, anyhow, the, uh, I'm not sure, but I would think that from our perspective in New Brunswick, someone that's concerned about the public health and safety should look at that review. Either the uh, medical health office or Department of Environment or someone that has our interests at heart. When I looked at it, I want to just share with you, and I have a one hour presentation on all the, the pitfalls of this review. But I'm just going to go over, just hit a few highlights, and I've got a, I've got a, a research paper here that's published on the issue that they have in Europe, same type of problem with the European review, and also a letter that I sent to the Department of Health Canada about my concerns. The first thing in this scientific review is, uh, is a defense of the value of glyphosate. And in a scientific report, I find it very weird to have something in there on economics. If we're worried about the health of people, economics really shouldn't be a factor. Um, well, when I get down to the brass tacks and looked at the science that was contained in it, there's 1,092 studies, not necessarily peer-reviewed. Most of them, 78% of them, come from the industry. So they're industry-sponsored studies. Uh, the only problem with industry-sponsored studies are of very short duration, 30 to 60 days. Many of them are not peer-reviewed, and it's paid for by companies for the companies. Um, the data and how recent it is, that's another huge problem. When you look at those 1,000 uh, papers, Almost half of them are over 20 years old. 14% have no date, and there's other papers out there that talk about a lot of toxicity issues with glyphosate that are not included in their review, and I don't understand why that is. Only 9% of the papers they looked at are in the last 10 years. So the, the currency of their research is really limited. Um, there's a lot of modern research that covers toxicity issues with glyphosate and they're not included. Science, in my mind, is not subjective, yet we find the review littered with all kinds of subjective words, estimated, believed, and every time they use the word significant, whenever I use that in my papers, I have to provide statistical background to support what I'm saying. But that term is used a lot in the paper and there's no statistics with it whatsoever. Unscientific in my mind. Um, the pattern that you see in each of the, each of the sections that they give, they, give a, they list some problems found in the research with the animals or the, the things that they were looking at. <coughs> then they talk about how they revised and assessed it and then they conclude that there's no concern. And it's, it's hard for a practitioner to look at these problems in the research. Then they start ch changing around how they're looking at it, and all of a sudden there's no problem. Um, there's many statements and conclusions that current peer-reviewed research contradicts, such as the ability of glyphosate to bioaccumulate. They say it doesn't do that. Well, there's lots of modern research that shows it does bioaccumulate. Talk about the presence in water, foods, human cells, and it not being an endocrine disruptor, and they look to the United States for, for research on that, when really we have all kinds of published literature that shows, peer-reviewed papers that show that it is an endocrine disruptor. None of that research is included. Um, they talk about incident reports, and they say that uh, there's no problem with glyphosate with bumblebees, and no one's ever found a bumblebee that's been killed by glyphosate, so there's no problem. That's called an incident report, if you find something that's died because of that. And I find it funny that they're using whether you find something like that or not to support what they're saying on whether it's good or bad. And again, in my mind, that's very poor science. Um, no one's out there actively looking at these animals and testing them for glyphosate. We, we looked at testing animals deer in the province. No one here knows how to test for glyphosate. There's no RPC, the vet college, nobody knows how to test for glyphosate because no one's looking at it. Um, when they do use incident reports, which is the scary part of it, there were 70, 71 incidences involving humans. There was a lot of serious effects, but there was other toxic substances, which is the POEAs and the emulsifiers and the juvens that's in the mixture. So they couldn't separate it out and say it was just glyphosate, so they just say, uh, you know, it's not a problem because we can't figure out whether it was glyphosate or not. It's even worse in the domestic animal incidents. Most of the domestic animal incidents resulted in death. They don't say what percent, they don't give numbers, but they conclude that even though these animals died from these incident reports, there's no necessary changes considered to the labeling. So I don't understand. They first of all say there's no incident reports, but when you finally have incident reports, they, I mean, my goodness, animals and people died and they just say there's no problem. Um, it doesn't give you a, very, a whole lot of confidence that there's a lot of science here. 
Um, there's other issues with mammals, but again, they come out and say the uh, risk, the inherent risk that we think is low. Unfortunately, Health Canada is not the only regulatory agency experiencing these, these problems. There's a, there's a huge issue, I'm not sure, Tim, you probably are familiar with it, what's going on in Europe, but there's the same problem there with the regulatory body and the scientific community, and they're at odds over whether to regulate uh, glyphosate or not. There's an independent research council, the International Agency for Research on Cancer. They pointed out this bias in the EU process. They keep saying they're not using enough of the research. They're using industry-sponsored studies. It's the same thing that I'm saying here in Canada, and I find it very ironic that they have the same problem in the EU. Um, the US EPA, similar problems. They've been into court. They've had a lot of problems in the last five to 10 years. And uh, again, their track record is far from being unblemished. The federal audit in 2015 by the Commissioner of the Environment pointed out that the PRMA continued to allow the use of a pesticide for over a decade after it was deemed unsafe. So again, that doesn't leave you with a whole lot of confidence in the Health Canada Review and reading it. I really question how scientific it is. I don't think we're really putting our money where, where it belongs. But that's what in New Brunswick we're actually relying on eventually. If, if, if it gets through, Health Canada, then everybody in the province is going to say, oh, it's okay, Health Canada says it's 